So I know we, we've heard a, a lot of different issues today, and <coughs> I think with our with our final panel, we're going to try to sort of take off the the biggest bite all at once, which is trying to understand what Iran is doing around the region, including uh, at home, both in its nuclear program and also in their domestic political issues. I would just uh, I would behoove everyone, if you're interested in the nuclear side of things, our Iran task force, which both Ray and, and John serve on, uh, issued a report in July <clears throat> in the wake of Iran's uh, gradual decompliance with the Iran nuclear deal, assessing where this moves Iran closer to a nuclear weapons threshold and what additional steps it might take and how that would uh, decrease its breakout time further. So it's, it's, it's mercifully uh, very, few, very few numbers and equations for something involving nuclear weapons uh, and it also has a very, a very tight executive summary. So I would, I would recommend that reading in addition to everything else everyone's gotten today. And uh, turning to our panel, uh, General Amador, this is your, your third panel you served on today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you just a quick respite to catch your breath uh, and move on uh, first to, to Ray, I think, to address an issue that has sort of been in the background of our, our conversations today. But I just want to sort of hit it directly head on uh, about the protests in Iran. Uh, to what extent are these about the superficial or proximate cause, which is the end of gasoline subsidies, and to what extent do these, are these more fundamental protests, and if they're more fundamental, uh, what's, what's driving them? Uh, th yeah, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I kind of see these particular protests as a continuation of the 2017-18 protests that happened in late December and early January of that year. And they all have a proximate cause of some sort of an economic situation, but the larger narrative here, in my view, is that the Islamic Republic has lost its last constituency, the working class labor groups. Uh, it, la it lost the middle class elements a long time ago because of electoral fraud in 2009. It lost the student and young people even a decade before that. So the last pillar of the support that the Islamic Republic presumed to have was the working classes, which they continually venerate from their podiums and so forth. And what they misunderstood is that those particular working class elements, in primarily in urban areas, are tied to the regime not because of piety but patronage. The Islamic Republic's last sort of source of legitimacy is the welfare state. It's a quite an expansive one. As they began to retract the welfare state benefits, you began to see that last pillar of support falling apart. Uh, we don't know all that we need to know about these demonstrations because of the information blackout. They seem to have been over at least 100 cities with ample casualties. I mean, the figure of casualties <laughs> move back and forth and it's impossible to say. But this is a real explosive problem for the regime because it no longer, it's a sort of a naked regime today with a regime without any form of constituency relying only on security services, which in my opinion, in a prolonged confrontation with the public, are likely to be unreliable simply because the demographics that the security services come from are pretty much the same as the protesters they're trying to repress. It's perhaps easier to get somebody from lower classes to go to university and bash heads. It's another thing to sh for him to use violence against somebody he recognizes culturally and so on. So this is a quite a serious problem for the regime and it's not ending because the Islamic Republic is basically bankrupt today because of its own mismanagement its own corruption and, and the economic sanctions which have proven quite debilitating. So as they deal with their bankruptcy, they have to continuously readjust their budgetary outlays. So they have to continuously cut expenditures here and there and everywhere in order to try to balance their books. So which means they're gonna confront further degree of popular protests. And whether they can manage it or not, I'm not really sure, but uh, it's, it's one of the more dangerous inflection points in the lifespan of the, of, of the theocratic regime, in, in my view. John, can I just, uh, uh, just add on to what uh, Ray said, and he got to it at the end, and um, I think there's all kinds of debates you can have about the maximum pressure campaign, is it working or not working, but in this regard, it's very hard to imagine the regime would have taken this risky a step <coughs> tripling fuel prices on a population that is already suffering significantly, um, if not for the maximum pressure campaign. They desperately need um, a reduction in these subsidies on fuel. 
They obviously want to take whatever fuel is then not purchased by domestic consumers in Iran to try and get it somehow overseas to export it and gain revenues. Um, uh, so they were willing to do that. I think it's a sign of, of perhaps what a cash crunch and a foreign reserve crisis they are now beginning to, to confront. I don't think anybody knows how little dollars or euros they have access to uh, that they could actually use for critical imports and to support the currency. Uh, but this type of thing, I think, is a signal that it might be much lower than, than a lot of people thought, that we really could be coming to a crunch time. And I think the fact, as Ray said, you know, um, Hong Kong, they've had really un unbelievable protests now for almost six months. You could probably count on both hands the number of people who have been killed in Ra Iraq. They've been unbelievably b bloody and gruesome. Um, they're now going on two months, probably at least 400 killed, if not more. In Iran, these things started on Friday. Uh, we've probably had an excess of 100 people killed in a few days. I don't think the regime has done this ever before in response to no, this kind right. of this kind of right. I think that too, the decision to kill, kill, kill in, his, in very large numbers very quickly is also a sign um, that they know they're, they're, in, they're in some degree of trouble. Now, whether it leads to the result that we all want to see and they kind of give up and say, we need to get back to the table, let's do a deal with Trump and then what happens? Um, or else they decide they've got to do something else, like start firing uh, missiles at Israel. Who knows? Uh, I don't think that'll be the case. But, uh, but I think this, this is a pretty good indicator to me that the kind of course, this maximum pressure course uh, that we're on is having real impact and having real impact inside of their own, their own backyard. Uh, so. And this, this question of the, the maximum pressure campaign is something I, w I want to circle back to. But uh, first, I want, to, I want to stick on the subject of, of the protests we're seeing around the region. And, and John, if you could elaborate on what we're seeing across the border in Iraq, both what you see as the driving causes and then also how you would characterize the response from ostensibly the Iraqi government, but potentially also its Iranian backers. Yeah, so, I mean, this is obviously what, I mean, the Iran protests are important in and of itself. The fact that they come right on the heels of massive protests um, uh, in basically the two most important Iranian strategic beachheads in the Middle East, in Lebanon and in Iraq. Iraq in particular, because it is a, a <coughs> Shiite-led government, a Shiite-majority country, and this, these protests are in fact Shiite-driven against the political system writ large, which has all the same failures as in Iran. It's not delivering uh, jobs. It's not delivering social services. It's not delivering clean, clean water. There's massive corruption and mismanagement. But in Iraq, they clearly see that the, a lot of this is because they've got a political system dominated by Islamist parties with connections to the Iranians, deep connections, as we all learned this week from the New York Times, that there are militias, unaccountable militias, backed by Iran um, that are doing awful things throughout the country, including leading the, uh, the large-scale repression we've seen over the course of the last couple of months, which just horrible, horrible killings, if you've seen any of these vid videos, and the snipers in particular, and the use of Iranian-made military-grade <coughs> tear gas, used not as a crowd dispersal mechanism, but to actually shoot people straight in the head. You see these videos of people with uh, smoking heads because they've got a, a tear gas canister that's uh, 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 that's been shot directly at their, uh, at their heads. Um, so there's a lot of domestic internal reasons, but in Iraq in particular, and to some extent in Lebanon, where it's also been Shiites in the street, and what you would think is Hezbollah's natural constituency, uh, saying that this existing political class, 
which let's face it, today is, it is a government dominated by Hezbollah is completely failing us and we are in absolute crisis. And across the board, whether it's in Lebanon now or Iraq now or in Iran, common denominator is this entire political system is not working. We want it all gone and to basically start anew with something dramatically new. And um, the unifying thread here is the Iranian domination of, uh, the, of the Islamic Republic over all of these. So I, at some degree, um, uh, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, I was thinking after the attack on Abcake that we are really on the defensive. It looks like American credibility is is, uh, uh, is declining and the Iranians are rising and we could be, be head, headed for real trouble in terms of Iran sensing it has a, a, a open field um, to play on in, in, in the Gulf, in the Middle East. Um, suddenly since October 1st, um, when the Iraqi protests broke out, we have now had this succession of turmoil in Iran's own backyard, and I think they are very much now on, on their back foot. This is, I would imagine, to some extent, Khamenei's worst, worst nightmare to see all of these things breaking out and so much directed at Iran itself and the Islamic Republic and the revolution and the, the damage it has wrought across the region, wherever it's touching. Um, that this is a serious problem for the Iranians. It's a much more difficult question to know how we can exploit this and build on it and use it to our advantage, which maybe we can get into. But I, I think that's a difficult policy call for the United States. Um, but, uh, but it's a good problem to have because I think, uh, I think the Iranians are under real, real pressure here. Uh, General Amidror, I'm as I mentioned to everyone, I would, there's a lot to cover, so I'm just gonna sort of hopscotch around the region. Uh, we've heard plenty today about uh, the the state of play in, in Syria. But one thing that uh, I've been struck by, and I've, Mike and I have talked about this, is the Iranians pulled off a pretty sophisticated operation, it would seem, to strike the Abqaiq facility in, in Saudi Arabia, whereas their, their retaliations against Israel have seemed fairly feeble to date. A couple of rockets shot across the Golan, relatively speaking. Um, is this a fair assessment, and, if, and why or why not? Uh, I want to add uh, two remarks to what was said about the demonstration. First, if you read the slogans of the people on the streets of both um, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, and Iran, it reminds me the slogans uh, during the Arab Spring. It's about the efficiency of the system. And, and not about, the, the details are less important here. Will it succeed? or not, it's another question. The, the second um, um, remark is, at the end, I think it's very much connected to the pressure of the sanctions because the Iranians lost the flexibility of a rich country which can react to such um, situations with pouring money and buying the demonstrators. It's, um, and, the, and, and, and Hezbollah is under pressure economically because they are getting less money from Iran and the Iranian government is in, in economic pressure because they don't have the money which is needed. And, and the third remark which is connected to the question that you ask, it didn't stop the Iranians from promoting their aggressive uh, policy in the, um, in the Levant. They continue to try to build the independent war machine in, in, uh, in Syria today. It, it, it didn't stop them from providing the Al-Quds forces all the capabilities which are needed <laughs> to build what they had in mind to build in, in, um, in uh, Syria. The answer to your question is, is, is that. What was the idea, the operational idea of the, of the what the uh, Iranians build around Israel. The ring of fire should be close to Israel and far from Iran. It will make much easier to attack Israel because you have many means to do it from 100 miles and you have very few if you have to do it from, um, I don't know, 1,000 miles. 
and you don't expose yourself because it is from Syria, from Lebanon, from Iraq, from Yemen, Houthis, militias, whoever, it's not Iranians. They can clean their hands. What they did in Saudi Arabia is something different. It was Iranian operation done by Iranians from Iran. And the capabilities that they have in Iran in the hands of the Iranians are much better than what they have today in Syria. Their dream is to build these capabilities in Syria. And this is what we try to prevent. This is exactly why we are so determined not to let them to build this capability, because if they will have this capability in the future in Saudi Arabia, we will see the semi tech on Haifa. And this is why, from our point of view, it's, it's not the existence of Israel, but the ability of Israel to defend itself. And we will not let them to build the same capabilities that they use against Saudi Arabia in in, in Syria, and in this case, not even in Iraq, because 600 kilometers, you can bring it from Iraq. And here, the Americans are very important, because in, in Iraq, there are American forces that should be part of the ability to neutralize the Iranians. Up till now, America is very cautious, and we understand why. Um, but still, uh, this is the situation. And you, if you ask why it didn't happen yet in Israel, because we prevented them from building these capabilities in Syria. Remember, almost a year and a half ago, almost two years, they launched a drone from North Syria through Jordan into the heart of Israel, not to the Golan Heights. It was directly to the heart of Israel. And we succeeded to intercept it and to bomb the command the caravan of the, of the uh, launchers. Um, but they have this capability to understand it. It is not going to be as easy as in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, we are not as big as Saudi Arabia, so it's easier to defend ourselves. You know exactly the directions and uh, much, much more prepared than, the, than, than Saudi Arabia. But we don't want to face these capabilities 100 miles from Israel. And just a, a, a follow-on question. You mentioned uh, in, in describing the Ring of Fire, you included Yemen, which seems like something we've been hearing about only recently. Could you uh, speak a little bit about the degree to which um, Israel worries about Yemen posing a direct threat? We, we, it's not a question of, uh, of worrying. The, 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 the Houthis are the best students of the Iranians using these uh, systems. And they have, technically, there is a range, um, there, there is a, I, capabilities that can cross Saudi Arabia. They have, first of all, they have to cross all Saudi Arabia, so we will have an, um, something in, a, in um, I don't know, kind of a buffer between us and the, and the Houthis. But technically, it's, it's, it's a possibility that you are taking into account. Uh, Ray, I'd like to continue the the jumping around uh, to, to jump back to Syria. Uh, the, the, in the last month, the U.S. drawdown, if not total withdrawal of forces from the country, seems to have been very welcomed by the Assad regime and also ostensibly the Russians. What's, what's the view from Tehran in terms of, in terms of what comes next or what, what they want to do in Syria now? Well, I think there has always been some latent tensions between the Assad regime and the Iranian backers of that regime. Uh, they have always wanted, from the beginning of the civil war in Syria, the Iranians wanted to train militias while Assad wanted them to invest in his armed forces. The Iranians won that debate because they want to control militias that the, that the Assad government does not. They wanted him to consolidate power over some 60% of the country that he sort of controls as opposed to try to unify the entire country. And that's another source of tension between the two because Assad obviously wants to try to capitalize on this to control the entire country while the Iranians want it to be a bit more circumspect given the fact that they would have to invest in any forward marches that he does. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure if the events in Syria have redounded to their advantage. If you're the Iranian regime today in Tehran, you are in deep trouble. You're in deep trouble everywhere. John talked about 
the Iraqi situation, and Iraq is far more important from their perspective than Syria. You're in trouble in the Levant uh, with Syria and what is happening in Lebanon. There's a Shia revolt against a Shia government that being repressed ham-fistedly by Shia militias that Iran directs. The collapse of the Iraqi pillar. It is unclear to me however sophisticated the Iranian military operation was against the Saudi Arabia, what they got out of it. Uh, I mean, you know, nobody capitulated to them and so forth. So the, the, the brazenness of it maybe is admirable, but the tangible effect is not entirely clear to me of that particular operation. Just because the American deterrent capacity or capability may have been diminished, that doesn't mean necessarily that Iranians gained. And at home, they are in profound degree of trouble. Uh, I think it is possible to start contemplating and imagining what the collapse of this regime looks like. Uh, one of the things that I have seen about the way they have handled the subsidy reform and the repression afterwards is how maladroit it was. This is not the first time they have, to subs they have tried to subs uh, control the subsidies on gas. Ahmadinejad did it better. Whenever you begin a sentence with Ahmadinejad did it better, <laughs> uh, you know, the, 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 the lack of imagination, the, the way they have repressed these particular protests with these shootings, this is not the way they try to do things. They try to be more sophisticated. Uh, and what you see is a distinct lack of imagination. This is a regime that's no longer capable of reforming. Uh, and that's, that's the biggest danger of all, the, the lack of imagination in addressing their domestic quandaries and being surprised by this, what is taking place in the region. Now, John mentioned uh, that one of the things that could happen is they come back to the table. That's actually what I fear. <laughs> uh, that's something that you said we should hope for, but we should also fear. Because one of the things they can do and thankfully they haven't done it yet, and I don't believe they can do it during President Rouhani's remaining tenure, is to essentially try to see if the Western powers can bail them out with infusion of economic financial investment and lifting of the sanction or easing of those sanctions. Coming back to the table, making some modest accommodations, returning to the JCPOA, that could get you the $15 million money from the front, I mean, that, if they can look beyond their boundaries and how the Europeans and potentially American sanctions can be relieved and European commerce, that could maybe, at least for the short term, stabilize the situation. I think the long term uh, bet on the Islamic Republic is likely to be a very poor one. I don't believe, I don't think there's anything inevitable about the prolongation of this regime. But if they're clever, they can try to play the Western angle and getting to the table and making some modest accommodations of the agreement, returning to the JCPOA, which is a profoundly advantageous agreement for them. Mm -hmm. And that's one way of trying to perhaps stabilize the situation. Uh, so that's something that so far they haven't done. Uh, I do think if, they, if for the next year, they're probably too domestically, they stalemated to do that. But come a year from now with a different Iranian administration and potentially different American administration or exactly the same American administration, I think the table can warm up again, if not sooner. And uh, John, to, to build off of what both you and, and Ray have said thus far, um, what do you get the sense Iran's goal is here? I mean, we've heard a lot of people say they just are going to try to ride out the clock until the next presidential election and hopefully somebody who... I think all, all the Democratic candidates have said some form of they would jump back in the JCPOA, and Iran's made sure to couch its nuclear violations in the language that these are reversible and we can easily come back into compliance with the deal. Do you, especially now with the maximum pressure of sanctions increasingly beginning to bear on Iran, do you, do you see that as a viable hypothesis that they're, they will try to wait this out for a year, or is this, do they try to use the leverage they build their <laughs> nuclear program and attacks around the region do they try to use that as leverage at the table? I mean, they have shown some interest in a potentially a JCPOA 2.0, if you want to call it, the Macron plan that was submitted to Rouhani. They've showed some interest in that. They haven't completely shut it down. So I'm curious sort of where you think this, this, right. this is headed, where the Iranians <laughs> want to head. Uh, I, I, obviously, I don't 
No. My thesis has been that, um, you know, when we went through a year after Trump was out of the JCPOA in which their strategy was clearly one of patience. Strategy was clearly one, we will stay in the deal, we will abide by the deal, and we will try and see whether the Europeans uh, are basically going to bail us out, figure out some kind of work around, around these sanctions. International the, the uh, as a lot of Western analysts were telling, uh, telling us, uh, you can't do unilateral sanctions. It'll never be as effective as the sanctions that Obama put on because they don't have UN support or international support. I think some Iranians believe that. Let's see whether the United States can really put pressure on us with these sanctions. Uh, and let's see what the Europeans do in terms of a workaround. All of that failed miserably. Their oil sales uh, went down at least as low as they went under Obama very quickly. International companies pulled out uh, in droves. Nobody wants to uh, take the risk of, uh, of angering and getting a designation from the United States Treasury on behalf of whatever pittance of business most of these multinationals <laughs> are doing in Iran compared to what they do in the United States. And that included these European bankers thinking of how we can do a, uh, a workaround. They weren't able to do it. The US was able to threaten them sufficiently. And they found they really couldn't do anything. So the Iranians came. In May of this year, Trump decides you know, that we're going to remove all of the oil waivers. Not only are we going to reduce them by a million and a half barrels, we're going to try and take them to zero, eliminate their exports entirely. And very quickly after that decision gets made in the end of April, you have Bolton coming out saying, we got a lot of intel. They're about to start a campaign of escalation. And they do start a campaign of escalation. And according to the people in the State Department, there could be as a, a, up to at least 80 attacks. And this was as of back in, in September that the Iranians have attempted, tried, things that they've tried to do, including obviously shooting down a US drone, doing all the things they did to shipping in the Gulf, attacking Saudi oil infrastructure, culminating in the attack on Abqaiq, in addition to the nuclear things they've done, these, these graduated escalations in, in beginning to move away from, from the JCPOA. Uh, and again, that was a different strategy, a strategy of uh, if this patient strategy didn't work, can we do escalation uh, in order to get to, um, uh, to either pressure the Europeans or the United States or somebody to begin relieving this sanctions pressure? I thought they went into that as soon as Trump said, we're going to zero, because they said, you know, with us going to zero, we can't wait until November of 2020 or January of 2021. Our economy might not, not be able to withstand this kind of pressure of, of us having zero exports. Um, so I think it's, um, it's still a, a, a <coughs> I'm not sure that they're thinking, like Ray suggests, that they can still wait till January 2021 20, to have a new president come in. And I, th I don't think these, these riots and what they've had to do um, uh, in order to try and, and get some more revenue, the risks that they've had to take suggests that they feel really comfortable and they can just continue to put this off. And I think the attack on Abcake was so <laughs> brazen. I mean, for four days, since 1980, January 1980, the United States has had an official declaratory policy that the security and stability of the Gulf and the oil fields there are a vital national interest of the United States and we're prepared to use military force against anybody who threatens it. The Iranians attacked the most critical piece of oil infrastructure on the face of the earth, and the United States did nothing. That is unbelievably brazen. They got away with it. I don't think they would have done it if they weren't quite desperate and trying to build leverage. And frankly, they've gotten something for it. If you remember back in August or September at the G7, in the lead up to the UN, it was a ridiculous display of the President of the United States, obviously desperate to get into a negotiation with the Iranians. He looked scared to death of any kind of military, possibility of any military kinetic confrontation with the Iranians. He gave maximum os oxygen to this cockamamie French plan to give them a $15 billion lifeline to the Iranians uh, in exchange for returning to the negotiating table exactly the kind of awful deal 
that Ray was referring to. You had this ridiculous scene of the President of the United States on a telephone line in New York while the French President was banging on Rouhani's hotel room. Please come out, come out and talk to the American President, have a phone call with him. And of course, Rouhani says, screw you. Now, why he says, screw you, at a point in time when he had the Americans and the French and others offering him money uh, just to come back to the negotiating table is an interesting question. And uh, uh, were they just, did they think they really had the Americans and could drive a much harder bargain? But all of that suggests to me that I still think a negotiation is, um, is very much still possibly in, in play. And um, whether the Iranians can get their system there, whether Trump can get our system uh, to that point. But I, I think just saying, we're not going to do anything until January 2021 and put all of our chips on a new American president kind of coming back to the deal and lifting sanctions is uh, particularly in the wake of all of this turmoil that's directed at, at Iran and its surrogate regimes uh, throughout the region uh, is a real risk for them, I, I, I would think. Maybe they can do it, but it's a, it's a serious gamble. I think that there are two, um, one big difference between the, the negotiations in uh, 2013 and 14 and, and the present situation, I think that more countries in Europe understand that it is not only the, um, the issue of uh, um, nuclear project, it is about the aggressiveness of the Iranians in the Levant and the long range missiles project of Iran. And in a way, the Europeans are more sensitive to those two facts than the Americans. And if they, and if, if America will be smart enough and the, uh, the Europeans will bring it into the table, any new agreement should be totally different. And, 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 and I'm not sure that this regime in Tehran is ready to compromise on those two issues which is succeeded to play <coughs> out with the negotiations with the Americans. And now the, the um, Europeans understand that that was a huge mistake. They led the Americans to put it away, but now they understand that it was a huge um, mistake. They see what happened in, in, in Syria. They see what happened in Lebanon. They see what happened in, in Iraq. They understand that the next stage of long range missiles in Iran is reaching Europe. And where the Iranians will stop. And I, I think that that will be more complicated if, if, if at the end it will come to the table and the, 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 the other five will join the Americans in the negotiations, it will not be so easy. Can I just say one thing about Please. this? I think uh, the, the general may not know this. Uh, the Iranian position on negotiations is actually clear. Uh, if you want a meeting, a summit, and so forth, you've got to pay for it. You got to pay the ticket price. We're not North Koreans. We're not going to throw a party for you. <laughs> you got to pay the admission cost. And that's what Macron was trying to do. He was trying to pay the admission cost. Uh, and if, that's, if the United States is prepared to waive sanctions and have some injection of money, 15 billion or whatever, as cockamamie as this, you're going to get your meeting. Uh, and President Rouhani has talked about the French negotiations and what happened in, Paris, in, in New York. He said the offer was very good and we would have taken it from another president. But we don't, Trump is unreliable and unpredictable. So if we're gonna get in the room and compromise some of our verities of being in the room at that level, you're gonna have to pay. And whenever we pay, we're gonna get our meeting. Uh, so far, so far, so far, we have been unprepared to do that. Now, I don't understand what returning to the JCPOA means. JCPOA was never a barrier to Iranian nuclear aspirations. We're seeing it today. They revamping all those capabilities. Obviously, not, none of those capabilities were retarded if they can jack up everything. JCPOA is a mirage. It's an agreement that's disappearing every day because of this riddle with sunset clauses. It was never a barrier to new Iran nuclear aspiration. It doesn't even exist as a text anymore because the text is disappearing. 
So I don't know what returning to the JCPOA practically means. You're returning to agreement that, you know, A, has not retarded Iran's capabilities as indicated by how rapidly they have restarted everything. B, it's, it's just disappearing as you kind of move along. And JCPOA is now, in two years, they're gonna, well, they're already doing it. They can install advanced centrifuges. They, 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 they can essentially do all the things that they want. They're already doing all those things, which means they're whatever. So it's just structurally coming back to that nuclear agreement is going to be difficult. I do agree that the Europeans, with the Macron plan of having a number of pillars, uh, essentially dealing with the region and the missiles, as well as the nuclear program, is sensible, but I do think that's a concession to the United States, it's a concession that could be withdrawn, as once again, arms control sucks all the air out of the room. Uh, so I'm not quite sure if the multi-pillar negotiation strategy that's on the table today is gonna be on the table. I mean, technically, the United States has, what, 12 demands? Right. <laughs> I mean, maybe 13. May, maybe 13, maybe four, <laughs> <laughs> maybe one. <laughs> so this is all, there, there's a lot of reason to fear the table. That's what I, I'll leave it. <laughs> um, so at, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to audience uh, Q&A. Uh, yes, you, sir. Oh, my, a microphone. No. I've had one question on this topic, and it's to all three of the panelists' uh, gut feeling, because you can't give an answer. But throughout the Cold War, um, the United <coughs> States and the Soviet Union held each other at bay with a concept of MAD, mutually assured destruction. We both, both sides had nuclear weapons. They knew that if they would um, attack, they would be destroyed. Would that work with Iran, your gut feeling? It's not a gut feeling that um, there was a guy called Rafsanjani and said, we don't afraid from Israel even if they have nuclear capability because Israel is a one bomb state. Um, Unlike Russia and America, uh, which each side understood that it will be destroyed. He said, we, we can destroy Israel, they cannot destroy us. I, I, I think I it's impossible, as you mentioned, question to ask, to respond with any measure of precision. Uh, uh, it, there, to me, a, a kind of looking at the Iranian political discussions and discourse, and true also during the monarchical years, is to the extent that they explain their situation and environment through the prism of conspiracy theories. Uh, this sort of a warped mindset. And I don't know if you want that warped mindset married to that kind of a capability. Uh, I don't know if Iran will preemptively use nuclear weapons against Israel or others, but I do think the tension in the region will be dramatically escalated with mini Cuban missile crisis every other day. Uh, nuclear brinksmanship in the hands of a regime that can be brazen, prone to conspiracy thinking, doesn't fully understand the environment around it, I, you know, that's in a, in a region that's already as volatile as it is. Second of all, I would say that nuclear weapons in the hands of the regime, at the very least, contribute to <coughs> prolongation of that regime. Because then the entire international community is invested in prolonging that regime because of, you know, at least it secures the nuclear weapons arsenal in some capacity, while this collapse will be viewed with some degree of concern and, and, and consternation, right? Uh, and I, I come to this issue maybe a bit differently. Is I, I, I think we need to start thinking about, we are likely to be marginal players, but not inconsequential players in the prospective collapse of the Islamic Republic, which I think is something we should start thinking about. Uh, there, there's no inevitabilities in history, there's no permanence to the regime of this sort. Uh, now, whatever happens, the drama is likely to be a pronounced in the Iranian drama, but I think we can play some kind of a role in it, and we already have. Uh, one of the advantages of the Trump presidency, he has destroyed Rouhani's presidency, <laughs> uh, which, is a, which is a good thing. Uh, now, I don't think he set out to do it, but he's done it. As John said, he demonstrated the cap capability of the United States to impose economic pressure on Iran and multilateralize that pressure 
even when European politicians don't agree with it. Uh, nobody believed that, other than a couple of guys at FDD. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Jensen. Uh, you were all constantly told that you can't possibly bring it to zero, their oil, because that would destabilize the global oil markets. Or you cannot possibly impose sanctions on them because the United States is going to be isolated as opposed to the Iranians because we're the ones who are acting provocatively. I mean, just think about the talking points of 2016, 17, 18. It's the bonfire of talking points destruction. Uh, so, you know, and I'll stop there. So. If, if I may add sure. before John will speak, if you, if you think about nuclear Iran, take into consideration that the whole Middle East will be changed. I don't see Turkey, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia agree to live in a Middle East in which the Iranians have nuclear capability and they don't. So if you ask yourself the question about Israel and, and Iran, you add to add to the equation the question of what will happen in the Middle East in which at least four um, Muslim countries will have nuclear military capability. And this is the minor one. I didn't speak about the Gulf and so on. Mm. But this is, this is the new Middle East <coughs> which will emerge from what was suggested there from, from you, might be understood from your question. I would just say, uh, yes, Amidro's point is a very Im Im important one. Um, you know, it's a, I would not want to test MED in, 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 in the Middle East if I don't have to. I'd really like to go to great lengths to, to avoid it. Um, it's held in most places. I mean, U.S., Russia, uh, China, Russia. Uh, India, Pakistan, a lot of people thought it might not hold there, but I mean, we've got a very small amount of time. It's still less than, uh, less than 100 years that these weapons have been, uh, been around, and we've had a lot of close calls. It didn't work as well as, as people thought. This is not, not the arena that I would want to test it in if I, if I didn't ha you know, absolutely uh, have to. So uh, uh, particularly in a, in a scenario like like Ray says, where we, um, you know, it may postpone the collapse, but <clears throat> one does have a sense that, like, like, like Soviet communism, this, this regime may not uh, be here forever. And at that point in time, when it does uh, collapse, I'd like to have as few um, access to, to really awful weapons as, as possible, because at, at that point, who knows, all bets are, are off. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to get two questions back to back. Uh, first, you, Charles, and then uh, you, General. My question is real easy or brief. Uh, I've been traveling for the last eight days, so I haven't been watching the news. But I get the sense that all these protests that are going on in the Middle East, is there anybody covering it? Is it getting any media coverage? And if so or it isn't, why aren't they? Why isn't there media covering this? It's difficult to do so in Iran because there's a news blank out. And there's, I think there's like one foreign correspondent still working for the Financial Times. <laughs> Everybody else has been kicked out. So even Iranian media is not covering it. Uh, I went through some of the, uh, I did my usual media tour. So there's an information blackout. I, I think the Iraq protests were covered reasonably well. The Times, uh, Ruben, uh, the, Ruben, the correspondent. I, I, I think we kind of had the idea of what was happening. Lebanon, I would say less so, but also because right now our news coverage, let's say, is preoccupied with other things. Uh, now, I can't speak about European press. I don't know. Well, I'm, I was talking about the United States. Yeah, or yeah. even Trump saying something. Yeah, no, it's been uh, my own sense is. Um, you know, again, yes, the export community that's looking at the New York Times, I haven't, I don't watch network coverage of it, but I bet it's very, very slim and very uh, few and far between the actual coverage of what, what was happening in Iraq. If you think as an American uh, concerned with the Middle East, with tens of thousands of troops in the Middle East, a lot of it oriented at the Iranian threat and Iranian aggression throughout that region to have Iraq a uh, place where America had invested so much over the last 16 years into this in project in Iraq, to have it blowing up in this way, Iraqi nationalism coming to the fore against our foremost targeting explicitly, day after day, our foremost 
threat and adversary in the, in the region. For me, it was obviously, it wasn't being covered in a, in a, in a sufficient think, way. Think and certainly, the, whether or not you'd say the president talking about it would help, I, I thought the State Department, even their statements were kind of back and forth, and it's an unclear situation. And, uh, but I, I think Pompeo is now on the right page John, in terms John, of think of about a, when Egypt was on fire. Every day it was on TV for right, a half right, hour every day right. on every television show. Yeah, no, it's, it's quite, quite different from that. And Absolutely. Nothing with, same with Hong Kong. Uh, yes, General, please. John, you make the comment about uh, waiting for the uh, successor to Trump in uh, 2021. Why would a successor to Trump make a decision to do away with these sanctions? What would be the rationale, given that we have to assume they keep working until January of 21? Why would you take the sanctions off? <laughs> Why would a Dem why would Elizabeth Warren want to take the, the sanctions yeah. off? Yeah, I mean it would make no sense uh, in terms of our national interest to do that unless there, whomever wins, is interested in a, a nuclear Iran. I think the narrative. I mean, uh, difficult for me to make the argument, but I think the narrative would would be, in fact, that the. Um, uh, are withdrawing from the deal, has all, had all kinds of neg negative uh, uh, side effects. The Europeans, where there's lots of antagonism between us and our best Western allies, that it has actually worsened the situation. Iran is now escalating its nuclear program. Iran dramatically increased its aggression uh, over the summer in the Middle East, including this attack on, on Abqaiq. The region is becoming more destabilized that somehow if the United States was to demonstrate its bona fides and good health by returning as a, as a member in good standing of this international agreement, uh, it, it somehow would make, help begin to stabilize what they see as a very dangerous situation that's kind of put us potentially on the brink of, of a war. Um, there is, I think, some movement amongst democratic national security types who understand something about this, who are in favor of the JCPOA, but understand now that you've actually got this leverage, you've got these sanctions, use this. Don't make your first move dropping the sanctions and why give something away for free? Use the leverage that Trump actually built up to drive the Iranians toward some kind of much better deal that includes some of the other issues that, that Ray and General Amidror talked about. Makes uh, sense to me. I think we've got time for one more question if there's somebody on, on this side of the room. Any last questions? Oh, please, Charlie. Um, Charles Perkins, just to take advantage of the Iran expertise here, um, Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force, is uh, I think attained a kind of a larger than life persona um, in some circles in the West. I'm wondering if you can speak to how much he is the the driver. I mean, obviously he's not at the senior, senior levels of the leadership, but how much is he the driver of the whole strategy in the Levant from you know, Iraq to Lebanon? And how much, uh, or is he simply implementing um, the, the desires of the, the higher leadership and if he were to disappear for whatever reason from the scene, would the, the plan across the region and the Gulf as well still maintain the same velocity? Uh, I'll, I'll start. Uh, there was a recent assassination attempt against him that was reported in the Iranian press, but mm. not, not in the American press, around, when he was around Baluch area, uh, where he was. Uh, there have been some tensions within the Iranian security establishment stemming from jealousy about the kind of attention that he was getting. And there was some criticism of him from people like Ali Shamkhani, who's a military revolutionary guard leader, currently the, Supreme, the secretary to the Supreme National Security Council, that actually that Soleimani has made some misjudgments about Iraq. That was the criticism you were hearing about him at the time of the rise of ISIS. That you know that he's not actually in uh, the, the the strategies and tactics that he has employed has not always worked. And some of uh, that's in the intelligence, yeah. uh, the, the the files that were released this week from the intelligence yeah, that's uh, right. agency in Iran yeah. criticizing Soleimani. Yeah. The so there is there have been some criticism of him. I suspect this strategy, as far as we know, 
and there's much that we don't know, is that the, the, the institutions in Iran actually formulate the strategy and so on and so forth. Now, he might have some tactical autonomy here and there, but I never believe he was 10 feet tall, and I do believe he's capable of misjudgments, and I do think he gets it, it surprised by events as we do. Uh, the events in Iraq were extraordinarily surprising. Uh, the rise of Iraqi nationalism, because you had always been told that sectarian identities had subsumed the sense of nationalism. Now you have the protests, which are very welcome, actually, uh, at, at least in terms of rejection of the Iranian patronage. Uh, so I, I, I do think there, there now he has to play a, a difficult hand because of the limitation of the resources that he has to deal with and some of the problems that they have internally. Uh, but even then, I think that he operates within the institution as far as I know. Well, uh, thank you all for being here today, for uh, listening to all our panelists. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, General Amidroar, Ray, and John. Thank you.